right, so we are now live uh, with our second power chat, which we're super excited to, uh, number one, be doing the project, but more than that, I think we feel so lucky to have the guests that we've been able to have. So George Lewis last week and today we have one of our dear friends, collaborators, favorite people on the planet, uh, Eve Beglarian. Um, so I, I was thinking about, as we were planning this, uh, it forced me to think about like the origins of the Eve and Load Bang sort of collaboration relationship. And I remembered the first time I heard your music, which would have been in probably 2007 when we had just started at MSM. And I found just sort of luckily had stumbled across this emergency music record that has landscaping for privacy on it, which is still, I think, one of my favorite pieces of all time. Uh, and so we, I reached out and I remember like it took a couple years to get a piece for Load Bang, but it, um, it's such a treasure for us, a piece that we've done dozens and dozens of times at this point. And so as I was thinking about it, I was thinking about your music and this idea of like, to me, it always feels um, so natural and organic, but in a way that it almost feels like the woods or something where it's natural and organic but not in a simple way it, like the organic comes from like this sort of depth of experience and complexity of form um and depth of concept so i think that brings us to jeff who's going to ask the first question um that we can sort of chat about uh your piece for us island of the sirens sounds great yeah i always talk about this piece whenever we do it live uh and i i bring up this Thing that I love about the piece, which is the the depth and complexity of reference in it, and the way that the piece sort of turns in on itself in these like never-ending spirals of of reference and idea. So I thought maybe you could talk about how this piece uh, was built and how those how those many layers come together. Yeah, well, it it really started as part of the river project. When I went down the Mississippi River, I got to this town, Plaquemine, Louisiana, where I heard this warning siren that it turns out goes of, uh, they test it every Friday morning at noon or something like this, or every first Friday of the month. And I happened to be there for that. And the way it echoed off of all the rivers was, just amazing. And so I sent someone there to record it with something more than an iPhone. And, um, and that became the sonic basis for the piece. Um, and then I found this poem by Rilke that talks about how difficult it is to describe an experience that you've had. And that really felt like it spoke very deeply about the experience of traveling down the river for me. Um, but of course, it's about uh, Odysseus trying to talk about his experience and about the song of the sirens that he heard. And so that connects to the actual physical warning siren because you've got the mythological sirens. And in fact, the terms are related, right? Like we use the word siren to refer to the sirens. It's like weird, something I'd never thought of before because we don't think of warning sirens as being seductive. Right, right. right. I mean, You're not drawn towards the, the cop <laughs> car going down Broadway. Right. Can't, can't, can't wait to hear more of that, right? <laughs> you know, yeah, so that's very curious. But, um, and so the, the piece is set up with quite a number of ways of experiencing the sirens because I sliced the recording of the siren into, um, into timbral layers and then asked the computer to try to transcribe those layers, which it fails to do, but it gives you notes. And then I hired eight fabulous female singers to record those notes, which are failed transcriptions of the layers of the sirens. 
and that then gets mixed in with the original siren layers so that you have this intensification of error-filled transcription as your tape part. Right. Right? And then the three of you who aren't singers are listening to various layers of that of that um, siren recording um, and trying to replicate it in real time. So you're listening to that on headphones and you are failing to replicate that in real time because it's far too complex for a monophonic instrument to manifest, as you know, plus you don't really know what to expect. I mean, even though you, by now, I have a question for you as performers. Have you now heard that tape part that you're replicating or attempting to replicate enough times that you can predict when various phrases are going to happen and kind of, in a sense, cheat? Uh, speaking for myself, there are definitely like, I know the tape part now. I think uh, I keep track of what pieces we perform and when, and I think we've performed this piece upwards of 20 times. So between that and the rehearsal process and the recording process, probably heard the thing 50 times or so. And it's yeah. not memorized, but I definitely know there's like a couple of little things that are coming up. I know one little really short pop on like a low riff <laughs> that I can always kind of anticipate. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I would say that uh, at this point, the thing that's most clear to me is the shape. Mm -hmm. So like, I think because of the complexity of it, it's not like I can remember like these sort of big moments or, or like registral shape, but the track is still so complicated, right? There's so much, there's so much sound and so much variety of types of sounds in it that like, I'm still playing it different every time because I still get to like choose my own adventure in terms of what I'm going to try mm -hmm. to communicate, right? Like having accepted the fact that I, this is going to be, this is impossible and I'm just going to do my best. I can pick sort of different things to try to highlight or um, use my instrument in a different way to try to communicate like a different, try to cop a different sound a little bit better. Um, yeah, memorize. I don't know, man, what a brain it would be to like <laughs> memorize something like that. <laughs> Yeah. 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 This is similar to to Andy and his comment. The the first few times that I played the piece, I noticed how how I came to a point where I I felt like I should stop playing by now. Like I played a lot. I've tried. I tried really hard. I'm gonna pause. I'm gonna listen. And after a few times of playing this piece, I realized that I never went back at the same spot. You always start listening to something new, and I'm like, I'm gonna try for that one this time. I'm going to go for that gesture and, and the beauty of just like pausing and realizing that there are so many things that I haven't tried in the past. Yeah. Blows my mind every single time I play it. Eve, I wonder, um, so one of the things that is super impressive to me in terms of what, what you and Jeff both talked about, like the depth of, um, like the amount of different ways that you're looking at this one concept, when you wrote this piece, um, did you have all that planned or did that all sort of line up before you started putting it together? Or did you find that like, as you started working on one thing, you sort of discovered a new connection and then discovered a new connection? Yeah, that's a great, I mean, I think I was really interested in how it would be possible for music to embody that sense of failure, of the failure of translation, the failure of telling, replicating an experience you've had by talking about it. And so I really was trying to think of all the different ways I might be able to embody that sonically. And I mean, the wacky, there are times that I'm sort of sad that the eight 
female singers are sort of immersed in the texture, like the way the way the piece works for the first three minutes, you don't hear them at all, pretty much. And then at the very end of the piece, you hear them quite clearly, like they are foreground and the original electronics have receded. But they're actually um, doing syllables from the Homeric text. So they're just the vowels right no consonants just the vowels of the homeric text so it's sort of like there's this sort of secret encoding of homer going on that like now i've told you that or you know who and you know that but like nobody would know that right nobody. it's like now, th now there's another layer that we're aware of that jeff has to work into his like pre-concert talk <laughs> yeah yeah it's it's gonna take too long eve now i can't i'm not adding that into the talk <laughs> but so, i just when, oh, sorry, i'm so jeff. glad yeah yeah i'm so glad that you said that about uh finding a way to embody that notion because i the thing that i find so intriguing about the piece and the way it works is that it is not a it doesn't make itself about a thing it makes itself into that thing mm. and i think mm. that's like that's a real magic trick that that mm -hmm. you pulled off with that that's cool so when that's when cool. you um when you decided to you know it's it's funny in a way that we're having this conversation and like digging at your brain a little bit more about the piece like what almost 10 years after we got it or something. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> uh, it's fun. It's, uh, yeah, so whenever, like, for instance, the Homeric text that you put in, was that a decision that you, like, did you know that that was a thing you were going to do once you had the female singer sing this part? Or did you find that you sort of had, you had this material from the feed that you were going to give to the female singers and had to think about what, then they were going to sing? Um, well, you know, now that I'm thinking about it, this, the, the sirens, the recording of the siren was also used in another piece that was an installation piece called Archives of Exile. And we, and that was a collaboration with a linguist in Sheffield, UK, a guy named Richard Stedman Jones. And we did a whole thing that involved sirens. And wow, I, I've forgotten all of this because the installation, it happened and it was really cool. And then it went away. So it has no continuous life, right? Whereas Island of the Sirens, your, your piece, as, as well mentioned, you know, you guys play it, you, sing, you perform it regularly. And so it has this life, this ongoing life, and is far more foreground in my life than this installation that happened 10 years ago in Sheffield, UK, right? But, um, but like we went and photographed, I went and photographed the mermaid parade at Coney Island, right? As part of this piece. And so we could have a whole video, you guys, I'm just saying, you know, like if you want to take it further, we could, we could bring that in. <laughs> That'd be cool. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if that answered your question. I lost track of the question. Yeah, I don't know if it matters. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Adrian, do you want to yeah, chat yeah, yeah. a little bit about the, the new piece? The, the new piece, you, you see where this is going. And since we're just on the topic of the impossibility, impossibility of playing your music, you know, the sirens, right? And I wanted, I wanted to ask you about what inspired you to use the text by the poem by uh, Brandon Constantine. The, the fact that you've mentioned before the, 
the piece can it's a, it's a little bit about how how naming things obscures them right how, how does how does the text relate to that and why having that that title for that piece yes Well, the genesis of that was that a visual artist, friend of mine, an Italian visual artist by the name of Vittoria Chiarici, wanted me to set some of um, Rilke's poems about roses, which he wrote towards the end of his life in French. And they are quite curious and hard for me to relate to. I did not find a way in to these poems about roses. They felt flowery and over the top and like not my kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. So we were, but she has these really interesting paintings of roses that she paints with the kind of paint that depending on the light you can see it or not see it you know so do you so, mean like, is it like a uv thing or is it like yeah yeah oh cool so, depending on the light in the space the painting is entirely different in daylight and in night which i think is really interesting and in fact curiously relates to the sirens in a way that I had not I mean we've got Rilke and we've got the we've got the impossibility of yeah yeah very interesting so so we I was struggling with what to do about these Rilke poems because I could not see a way of having you, Jeff, sing these poems. I, I just couldn't get there, right? And there's a poem of the day thing that shows up and it showed up in my inbox and it was this poem uh, by Brandon Constantine that was like, you can't ever put roses in a poem, you know? And you were like, yes, lot. you're right, get them out of here. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and it just seemed, totally perfect and then the sense that the poem ends like there's this business about what you can't say which is roses but then the poem ends with the line the green place this island which also connects to of course the real the, the island of the sirens right so here there's a rose-shaped island at the end of his poem they can't exist, but you're counting on to be there, unmapped, unmentioned until now. The green place you imagine hiding when the world finds out you're not who you've said. Right? So to me, that was just perfect because here's the rose which you can't name, and here's the thing that you've said you were one thing, but in fact, you're something else. And I was thinking about it actually in preparation for talking with you tonight, that like in a way we're in the inversion of that right now, all of us, where we're who we said we were, but the world is not what it said it was, right? And we're in the process of trying to figure out how to function when the world has sort of completely belied any expectations we could have had, you know, about what our future was going to be. Right. Like we're changing the, the, the way that those, both those poems and these pieces deal with notions of like in a really broad and literal sense, identity, like of not just who you, who you are, but sort of labeling things or communicating, communicating things or saying that one thing is like another thing uh and then rather than that being about uh self-determination or communicating something about yourself we've sort of like <laughs> it's everything turned out 
Yeah, I think this actually might dovetail pretty nicely into the question I had for you. So you've traveled this country so many times, and I think of the river project where you went up and down the Mississippi by various means of transportation and really spent time in the land and with the people. One thing I've always admired about you and known about you is your empathy towards everyone, people from different stations of life and different places of life. When you meet people, you always search for the empathic connection with them. And I've seen that and always admired it a lot. Um, to tie it back into the sirens, it's impossible to kind of convey your experience on the river project and equally it's impossible to convey kind of the fullness of your heart that I've seen when you talk to people. But what I'm curious to know, um, the America that you traveled through during the river project and the America that we live in now, you, did you see this, any of this coming? How do they kind of, do they superimpose on your on each other in your memory or do you feel like one informs the other or the present retroactively informs the river project in some ways i'm really curious um mm -hmm. how your relationship with the land and the people of this land has evolved from them oh well hmm. that's such a beautiful question and we could probably talk for like an hour about just that we have eight minutes <laughs> You're right. We have eight minutes. Let's see. How can I say this? My urge to go down the river came from a delayed reaction to Hurricane Katrina, which awoke, awakened me to the horrors of racialized poverty in this country. And I will never forget the National Guard aiming guns at the people who were trying to get out of New Orleans on I-10. And, and, and it woke me up to the idea that that is the country we live in, right? Where those people got turned back and put into the whatever that place was called, right? The super Superdome. So, so, and subsequently we had a crash and then we had the election of Obama. And so I was like, I need to find out what's going on in this country. I need to understand all of this. And so I'll do this one person WPA project in order to try to find out what's going on. Right. And in a certain way, none of what's happened politically, all the seeds of it were there in 2009 going down the road. All the seeds of it. The mistrust of government, which when you come right down to it, that's how we get Trump is that we've lost the ability to imagine a government that actually took care of us, right? So, so there's that on the one hand, and there is the ongoing white supremacy that runs this country, that is just simply a fact, it's in, it's in the soil. And how we're going to get to the next place because it's not about repairing some it's not going back to some time when things were right it was never right obviously i mean i don't need to say that to you um and yet i love this country i love this country and I want us to figure it out. And I, and I don't know how we're going to get there, but I feel like living into the discomfort of right now 
as artists, as people, rather than trying to normalize and say, yeah, um, let's get, let's get, let's get to something that feels comfortable, like to live with the discomfort, I think is what is being asked of all of us on every level to with all our heart and all our strength live into that discomfort so that we can find a way to do something new that is healing for the future you know was that eight minutes Probably. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. Keep it going. Keep it going. Keep it going. I wonder. Um, I know, like a lot of pe people are having such varied experiences of like the now, both in terms of the social unrest and and the pandemic. Um, have you been making art? Um, at first, not at all. At first. All I could do was be anxious and clean my house, you know, and like organize piles of denial and stuff like that. That's what I did for the first, I don't know, six weeks. And then I started making things, but I found I couldn't finish anything. So I would make stuff, but I wouldn't, you know, I mean, I have microphones, I can record things like there, I, there's no problem. I, you know, I can do that. I've been doing it all my life, right? I simply could not take that, the step that would then lead to calling it finished. Something about that, I just couldn't get over that hump. And then I began actually having external deadlines, right? Like I had to deliver the score and parts for a chorus and orchestra piece. When it will ever be performed, I have no idea. But contractually, I needed to deliver it. And so I had to like sit down and make scores and parts. And it was like, okay, sure, I can do that. And it was actually really comforting there was something really nice about having this external deadline right you know? like a, a contractual deadline and actually like having to do something is just like back back into <laughs> life this is where we live this is what you yeah. do you're doing yeah this is my job you know so um and and in fact the vicksburg project which is a project i've been working on it's a collaboration with uh, karen candell and mallard catlett uh, about women in Vicksburg from the Civil War to the present day. It's like sort of a song cycle with, but it's become theatrical. So, and I mean, I conceived of the project going down the river and then it has continued. And of course it was supposed to premiere in June and it didn't happen obviously. And so now it's postponed and in a certain way it's awesome because we will be able to go deeper for having more time. And, and what I'm realizing is that what felt like it was going to be the present day, the last section of the piece is actually going to be historical because it's going to be about, you know, the teens, and the 20 teens are an entirely different thing. Like that, you know, everything is different now. So that'll be interesting. That's great. Um, I think unfortunately we have to wrap up though. So like you mentioned, we could do this forever and have done this for much longer <laughs> periods of time. But uh, in order to be true to our word and our uh, power concert, power chat, keep it tight relationship. It. Uh, the, yeah, I mean, I, I just want to thank you for, for taking time to do it, but also I feel like, um, our lives as like the load bang unit, but also as individuals feels like so artistically and emotionally enriched by having like you in it. 
Oh, uh, you guys. You're going to make me cry up here in my little composing cabin in Vermont. <laughs> well, that's, you know, that's like the whole goal of doing these things. Who's the first to cry? Who wins at the power check? <laughs> <laughs> But thank you, Eve. Um, thanks for everyone who tuned in. We will be announcing our next one coming up in the next week or so. So uh, uh, thank you all. Thank you, Eve. A pleasure. Thank you so much. And we will see everybody soon. Love you guys. Be you good. Bye.